Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC309, our course on urban church planting. Let's get started today. May I request somebody to please pray with the class and we will start. Anybody could pray and we'll start. Go ahead. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you. Thank you for this day, for this class. Thank you for all things, Lord. Lord, we surrender to you. Help us to learn. We surrender to the word of your grace, which is able to bring us, Lord. Help us to know, to know, know the things of God, to do your good to your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah. Thank you. Thank you, Siddhant. Okay. So in our course now on urban church planting, we uh, have uh, started a new section last week talking about the uh, spiritual side of uh, Urban church planting. How to you know? We want to understand what is what is involved, then how to go about engaging on the spiritual side. So let's quickly review a few things we mentioned last class, and then we will move forward from there. So, one minute. Seems to be a question. Shri Kumar. Uh, yes, sir. I have a question. Um, can I ask now? What can I ask? Yeah, you? Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, sir. Th sir, uh, as we are discussing on this uh, uh, this church planting, uh, one thing I just want to know um, that uh, you know um, how we should um, you know as a servant of God, uh, how we should receive the offerings and the tithe, and um, you know, and uh, because it's not the salary, but it is uh, you know God's money. So how we should handle it? Because most of the people, uh, I think that uh, you know, when they take it, they take it as the in a very different way. So I just want to know that uh, if you can also help us to understand that um, how we have to use it, and um, because it's a God's offering, and especially when it is a first fruit or a tithe or or a seed when somebody is sowing. So how we have to receive it and uh, how we have to handle it. Thank you, sir. Mm, okay, so the question um, that Sri Kumar just asked is about how do we handle the money, the tithes and the offerings that people give uh, to the local church. I think, uh, and Paul also does this in First Corinthians chapter nine. He points back to the Old Testament, where you know he says, I mean, so the Old Testament sets us a pattern, and then that that's. Uh, that connects into the New Testament. Uh, see, in the Old Testament, the tithes, the offerings were brought to the tabernacle or the temple, and it was given to the priests for their use. Basically, the priests and the Levites had no inheritance among the people. That means they were dedicated to serve in the temple. And so whatever was needed for them, uh, for their for, to take care of their lives, and for the work of the temple came from uh, the tithes and the offerings that were provided. So basically, the work of the, if you want to put it in simple terms, the work of the ministry was funded by the tithes and the offerings that people brought to the tabernacle or the temple. Paul points that off, you know, and then when you come to the New Testament, um, you read about this, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is a good reference point where Paul says, you know, God has ordained that those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Galatians chapter 6, he says, you know, let him who um, ministers, uh, who was ministered to in the natural, uh, in spiritual things, minister to them back in natural things. That means we serve the people spiritually and they give back into our lives naturally. So in the New Testament, um, Tithes and offerings. People give their tithes and offerings to the local church. Now, whatever the form of the offering is, whether it's a, you know, they just whether it's somebody says, okay, this is my first fruits, whether it is uh, a special offering, whatever. People give their tithes and offerings to the local church. Now, 
this is what I, I, I feel should be done. So the money has to be handled in a very honorable way. Uh, the way uh, the, the right thing to do is that all the expenses from that, so the money would go, I mean, let's, we'll just get into the details and answer this. So the money goes into the account of the church. From there, the people who are serving in the full time people in the church, they are paid their salaries, fixed salaries, and then all the other expenses of the church, meaning, you know, whatever is needed to run the church, meaning the rent, the bills are paid from that money. So, just like in the Old Testament, it was used to take care of the functioning of the tabernacle or the temple. The New Testament, the tithes and offerings are basically used to take care of the people who are serving in the ministry as well as all the expenses of the ministry. Now, of course, this has to be done in a proper way. That means the, the pastors, the others who are working are paid a salary, reasonable salary, and then all the bills are paid, right? What should not happen is all the money shouldn't go to the pastor. You know, in some cases, especially in small congregations or things like that, you know, the whatever matai then often comes, just goes to the pastor, or they put it directly in the pastor's account or whatever. You know, so there's no accounting of thing, and then uh, I, I don't know how they manage things, but that's not. You know, it should go to the church. The local church should be an organization where money is received, and from there people are paid, and everything is properly accounted. I know in some places they say the tithe goes to the pastor, the offerings then go to the church. Um, I don't see that as a valid uh, use of money. I don't think that's right. I be, you know, it should all go to the church, and then everybody's paid a, you know, a proper salary and so on. Because if all the tithe goes to the pastor, the pastor's getting <laughs> the major part of the money, and then there's nothing left for the church operation and others. So everything goes to the church. From there, money is allocated and so on. Um, I've seen other, or rather I've heard of other variations where um, uh, you know, where, uh, like I said, the tithe goes to the pastor. Sometimes the, the pastor gets tithe from multiple churches. And uh, uh, you know, so all the churches that are supposed to, under that, they give their tithe to the pastor and then uh, something, an offering goes to the local church. And I think all of that is an unfair distribution. It has to be fair, it has to be done properly. So everything goes to the local church. From there, everybody's paid a salary. Everything is accounted for is how I would recommend doing it. Uh, the New Testament per se doesn't give these instructions. So the answer should be, let's do what is right and fair. And what is right and fair? I think it's a proper, it's just basically the organization should be run in a proper way. Did I answer your question, Sri Kumar? If you have a follow-up question or any more details, you could Nothing ask. Sense. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. okay. Christopher, please go ahead. Oh, yes, Pastor. Thank you. Um, my question is a related question uh, with regards to um, you know where where there is uh, where there is surplus. Um, is there any uh, provision a surplus from you know the expenditures of the of the church and the operations and the salaries? Is there any um, provision for um, you know I mean as per the Bible? Uh, where the you know the less fortunate get uh, get some percentage of the uh, of that of those of that surplus. Uh, that is one uh, one area, and the other one would be um, in um, planning forward. Just like in a you know in a, in a, in a say maybe in a, in a corporate environment where you have uh, uh, some plans about you know how the how the institution or you know a company plans forward on you know uh, where they want to invest money um, um, is there any um, um, again provision for, for 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 that and what happens in that planning process where 
these tithes and offerings actually reduce for whatever reason. I mean, I, I'm just, uh, I guess, uh, assuming over here, you know, you know, during COVID, maybe the, you know, these tithes and offerings possibly could have re reduced. So, what happens in that in that planning process, and uh, you know, how does that sort of, you know, um, get taken care of? Yeah, mm. so that's really my question. No, the, the two questions. Mm -hmm. So, in in the Bible, um, and and the context of the local church. We do see, and this is in, I'm, I'm thinking about First Timothy chapter 5. Uh, I'm also thinking about James chapter 1 and 2, where um, the instructions are that in First Timothy 5 especially, he talks about widows, you know, the widows, orphans, James chapter 1, who can be supported by the church. Of course, the first instruction there is, if there is a widow and she has a family, then let the family take care of her and let her not become a, a, the responsibility of the local church. But if that situation is not there, if the widow has served well in the local church and has been serving the church, then the church is uh, should take care of her. That's First Timothy chapter five, um, uh, and then of course to orphans and yeah, to orphans and. The the poor. Okay. So there is no, there is no, you know, like I say, um, there's no percentage dictated by scripture other than the scripture saying, you know, take care of those who are in need. They're telling the local church to take care of those who are in need, provided there's nobody else around them, the family, to take care of them. So that's the instruction we see uh, in these passages. So uh, every, uh, so the local church should, you know, in addition to, okay, the tithes and offerings come into the local church, they are paying their salaries of the people who are working, they are um, paying off all the bills, the expenses, and then um, they should also use, you know, or, or as needed to take help take care of the needs of the people who, who don't have family, who don't have people who can take care of them. So to that extent, the local church is instructed to take care. Right. Now, again, it could vary from church to church. Some churches are able to do it. Some churches don't have the means to do it. And so now I don't think we can you know, demand uh, for a local church to do it. But according to whatever extent uh, they have the capacity to, they can extend help and support and so on. Uh, so that's the first part uh, of the question. The second question in terms of planning and so on, yeah. So uh, definitely, like you know, we're learning in the other course. Uh, we must uh, uh, the church or the ministry must be run well as an organization, must be administered well, and then part of that is making sure the money is allocated for various purposes, and then also planning happens for uh, budgeting happens for the future. Uh, if for whatever reason uh, the inflow of contributions go down, then obviously there has to be a pullback. Um, you know, again, this is not a uniform rule, but uh, uh, generally, I'm just speaking from a natural point of view, there would be a pullback on where, you know, what, what the church is allocating for various ministries. Uh, but again, it varies from, you know, how the Lord would lead the congregation to do. So, so typically they would pull back on um, areas where they don't need to necessarily be spending money and then focus on a few areas that they need to. So uh, that again is left to the leadership as they decide. Basically they want to, you know, they should administer everything properly. They don't want to get the organization into any form of debt. They don't want to, you know, fail to pay the bills that they owe. So therefore, Things have to be managed properly. Um, yeah, so and I, I don't see anything wrong in that. I just feel that uh, there has to be proper stewardship of money and careful expenses. Be careful with the expenses. You know, one of the things we did. Uh, I, I guess I'm sharing content of the other course here, but uh, we probably repeat it when we come to the finance part. But one of the things from the very early days, uh, when we in the smaller days, early days when things were smaller. I used to tell our person over the managing the money as to make sure that every month we have a surplus of uh, 
200,000, you know, 2 lakh. Uh, that's our minimum. So always make sure that our expenses are less than our income, uh, you know, by so that we have a surplus of two lakh rupees every month, at least, uh, so that you know we can keep that money aside. So that was in the early days uh, when we were small, and you know we, and that. And so then that that kind of discipline continued. So now we we are able to do a lot a lot in surplus. Some months when we exceed our expenses, exceed our income, which we are very aware of, because sometimes we may do a you know a huge event, a huge conference, or uh, we may do something very big, and um, our, so then it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect us because there's always a big surplus from which we pull out, and it just evens out in the next month, the following months. So we are not afraid when <clears throat> in certain months. Even if we go over by a lot, uh, it doesn't matter. Usually, that happens when we do a huge printing. You know, suppose we print four or five titles, which is what is happening right now. Uh, since you know we've resumed the printing of our books, uh, there are huge volume of books being printed. So obviously, the expense will be huge. But then it doesn't affect the overall bottom line because uh, there's this surplus that is being put towards this. I hope I answered your question, Christopher. I don't know. Okay. All right. So let's get to this now, the spiritual side of uh, church planting, which we were just um, uh, looking at. So we were talking about the spiritual aspects. Last week we started this. We said the real battle of souls is a spiritual battle. Uh, we were saying, okay, that we understand what the devil is doing. He's blinding the minds of people. We went through these scriptures. where uh, So the real battle is we are bringing people out of his uh, influence over their minds. And Satan can use, you know, uh, various kinds of deceptions over their minds of people. So uh, in urban centers, uh, usually it is a lot of um, ideas, ideologies. Uh, uh, you know, the Bible talks about doctrines of demons. That uh, that means these are philosophies and ideas that are inspired and motivated and supported by demonic powers. So these are things that blind the minds of people, and we have to deal with that. We will talk about about prayer coming in, you know, uh, and dealing with this. But we're just talking about what's happening. So the other way the enemy hinders uh, is by just intensely holding people in bondage. In various forms of, um, you know, we can use the term spiritual prisons, uh, or uh, you can call it strongholds. Uh, this uh, usually is seen or is expressed in that center, urban center, through various, you know, evils that can be seen: uh, immoral, sinful deeds, addictions, social evils, and so on. So there are spirits of disobedience that are at work. So in Ephesians 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul, you know, writes the, writes about this. And he mentions that, you know, uh, be, uh, yeah, of course, he's talking about be pe believers before they got saved. And, and he says, you know, we had the spirits of disobedience at work. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 2. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So notice there is the, the, the course of this world, the fashions, the patterns of this world that held us. Secondly, there was a prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan and his influence. And thirdly, he's talking about spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, the spirit of disobedience, just working in the lives of people. So this is the second part, holding people in bondage, specifically to various forms that we can see in a city. So we'll have to deal with this. In First John five nineteen, he says the, the whole world lies in the in the grip or in, in the under darkness. So darkness is covering, holding people in bondage. Another important, another area the enemy works is in actually hindering the proclamation of the gospel through various ways, you know, could be in numerous ways. And uh, can we just read these scriptures very quickly so 
uh, we we get an uh, we get the idea of what Paul is writing to us about. Um, somebody could read this. Romans 15, 30, 31. Then we'll go to First Thessalonians 2. Somebody could read these for us, please. Pastor, can I read? Go ahead, please. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in, a, in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that may that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, mm -hmm. that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Paul is asking for prayer. He's asking the believers at Rome to pray with him. He says, strive together with me in prayers. And he's saying, you know, you, you pray with me for what? Verse 31, oh, to be delivered from those who are in Judea. So here there are people in Jerusalem specifically who are against him, who are waiting to, you know, to harm, do him harm, arrest him, so on. And so he's praying, he said, join with me in prayer for this, because he's planning to go into Jerusalem. And we will see. Let's look, go to First Thessalonians 2. Eighteen. Somebody could read that. Shall I read Pastor? Please go ahead. Because we wanted to come to you, I Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Thank okay, you. thank you. And second Thessalonians three, one to three. Can I read past? Yes, go ahead. Second Thessalonians three, one to three. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Amen. So uh, in all of these scriptures, we see you know, Paul facing opposition from the Jews. Second, uh, he mentions directly, Satan hindered us. Thirdly, in 2 Thessalonians 3, he talks about you know, unreasonable and wicked men. So there is opposition to the work he's doing, coming in different ways. Uh, people who don't understand what's happening, people who want to hinder the work, and then Satan himself trying to do things uh, to hinder the proclamation. So in different parts of the world, this can be expressed in different ways. Uh, uh, how the hindrance to the furtherance of the gospel comes, you know. Uh, and so we, we need to be aware of it. We don't need to be intimidated by it. We don't need to stop the work just because there is hindrance to the work of the gospel. Uh, but then we engage in prayer. That We'll talk about that later. How do we counteract this in prayer? You can see that. Paul asked for prayer, you know, in Romans 15, 2 Thessalonians 3. He asked for prayer, so pray with us or pray for us uh, in view of this opposition that we are facing. You pray. Fourthly, uh, the way the enemy would work is by just seeking to infiltrate. Um, this is like, okay, he's trying to get in to and disturb what's happening in the work itself, in the local church. And... Uh, we see this especially in uh, Revelation chapter two, uh, when the Lord Jesus is, you know, speaking to these seven churches. He, you can see that the Lord is very aware of demonic presence in those cities. You know, He says uh, there is to the church in Smyrna. He says there is the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue means assembly, a group, a gathering of people who belong to Satan, and they are going to do harm to the church in Pergamos, he says, you know, you're in a city where Satan's throne is, Satan is dwelling there, and there is, you know, wrong doctrine, 
that's coming into the church, the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, the church has, uh, you know, uh, uh, unknowingly welcomed this doctrine. It's filling, causing people to go away into idolatry, into immorality. And uh, the church in Pergamos has, you know, allowed this thing to come in. The church in Thyatira, there was another problem there, a false prophetess Jezebel has got into the church and she's again doing the same thing, uh, convincing people into immorality and idolatry. The church in Philadelphia, the Lord recognizes that uh, there is a group that belongs to Satan, that means there's people, they're actually, they belong to Satan, they're called the synagogue of Satan, but he says to the church in Philadelphia, I will cause them to come and bow before the church. So very powerful. The point is, in every city where the local church was, there was also Satan doing things. In, in Smyrna, they were facing physical persecution. Pergamos and Thyatira, false doctrine had infiltrated the church and is, is disrupting, is disrupting the church. Now, of course, it was the responsibility of the church and the leaders to protect the church. That's why they have, they're called shepherds or overseers. They're supposed to protect, they're supposed to guard the church and prevent this from happening. But in these two cases, it had already infiltrated the church and had already, you know, uh, affected people, causing people to go astray. Uh, the church in Philadelphia, I think, is so beautiful. Uh, the Lord recognizes that there is a group of Satan there in that city, but he says they are going to come and bow before the church. That means the church is going to exercise dominion over these people who are actually backed by demonic powers. And um, so that's, I mean, that's a great place to be. And that's the type of church we should be where, you know, it's okay if in the city there are, there is demonic activity going on, but that will come and bow before the church, and the church will exercise dominion over those things. So, just to quickly review, the enemy is at work. How is what's he doing? He's blinding the minds of people, holding people in bondage. He uh, attempts to hinder the proclamation of the gospel, Satan and his demons, and sometimes the uh, demonic powers attempt to weaken the church by infiltration. They try to come in, cause things happening. So we have, you know, when you're pioneering a church, the spiritual side is we are in spiritual battle. Yes, you know, we have talked about all the natural things, the planning, the organizing, all of that is important. Uh, you know, people need to have a proper place to come and worship and fellowship and learn and grow and worship all those things all that is there but we must not forget we are involved in a spiritual work and there is spiritual battle involved so we have to be ready spiritually we will make a big mistake if we only focus on the natural you know preparation and natural engagement and forget and neglect the spiritual side. So as especially as leaders, you know, as people are pioneering the work, you, you and I, we should give ourselves to a lot of prayer and, you know, uh, be aware of this and we will talk about how to go, go about doing this. So the church is called, you know, our responsibility is to basically be light to the Gentiles to open prison doors, to bring those out of darkness, out of the prison house. Let's read these verses because I think they're just beautiful. Isaiah 42, uh, one, 1 to 7, let's read that. Isaiah 42, somebody could read that for us. Isaiah 42, verse 1 and verse 7, then... It's forgetting. Go ahead. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment 
to the Gentiles. The seventh word, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Mm. Now, it's very interesting. Um, Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus, the Messiah. So Isaiah 42, 1, when he says, my servant, my elect one, that's referring to Jesus Christ. So he says, I put my spirit upon him, so the Lord is anointed. And he's going to bring forth justice to the Gentiles. So Isaiah himself prophesied that Jesus was going to be a light to the Gentiles. So, you know, this is amazing because 700 years before Christ came, Isaiah is pointing to the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, and says he's going to be a light not just to the Jews, not just to the Jewish people, but he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. He's going to bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And uh, in verse 6, he says, you know, you're going to be a light to the Gentiles. But then in verse 7, as part of being light to the Gentiles, Okay, let me say this. So Jesus reaching the Gentiles is being fulfilled through the church. Because remember, in his earthly ministry, he was he came only to the house of Israel. So how is Jesus fulfilling Isaiah 42 now? He's fulfilling it through the church. The church is his body that is being a light to the Gentiles. So Jesus is not here physically, but through his church, the body. He's being a light to the Gentiles. He's fulfilling Isaiah 42 through the church. And as part of that fulfillment, in verse 7, he's saying, you're going to open blind eyes. You're going to bring prisoners from the prison and those who are sitting in darkness from the prison house. So what is the picture here? As people who are imprisoned are going to be brought out, are going to be set free. Who's going to do it? The church. Jesus is going to do it through his church. So the church has this responsibility to bring prisoners out of the prison, to open blind eyes. So, and obviously he's talking about spiritual things here. He's not talking about literal physical prisons, although God may use some to do something like that. But he's essentially talking about the spiritual dimension, opening blind eyes and bringing people out of demonic control. Isaiah 49 repeats that. Can somebody read it? 8 and 9. Isaiah 49, 8 and 9. Thus says the Lord, In a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages. Saying to the prisoners, Come out to those who are in darkness, appear. Mm -hmm. They shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall be their pasture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here, yeah, God is saying, you know, tell the prisoners, come. Those who are in darkness, come into the light. So that is our call today right, as the church. So the church is therefore now commissioned to do the work of bringing people out of darkness into the light of the gospel, of bringing people out of the prison, setting the captives free. Like we said, the devil is holding them in bondage. The church has to bring them out, liberating them, setting them free. Right? And then Jesus made it very clear. If we, Let's jump now, sorry. To Matthew 12. Um, uh, we'll, we'll read these two passages uh, because it's interesting to put them side by side. Matthew 12, 28 and 29, and also Luke 11, please. Matthew 12, 28 and 29, somebody could read it. Sir, Matthew 28. Uh, Matthew 28, 29. Yes, please. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
But how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And indeed, he may plunder his house. Thank you. Thank you. And Luke 11, 21, 22. Sir, can I? Go ahead. When a strong man armed uh, keepeth his place, uh, keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh for him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divideth his points. Thank you. Sir. Mm. Thank you. So in both these passages, Jesus is dealing with the subject of deliverance. Yeah, Matthew 12, 28, he says, If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out devils, then the kingdom of God has come to you. So he's talking about casting out devils. He's talking about deliverance work. Same thing in Luke eleven twenty. He's talking about casting out de demons with the finger of God. Right. So it's just talking about the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about deliverance, casting out demons. And in that context, he's saying, we have to bind the strong man, or we have to overcome the strong man, then we can spoil his goods. So basically, in delivering people, and bringing deliverance to people from Satan's hold on their lives, what we're doing is we are dealing with a strong man. We're dealing with the demonic power that's controlling them. We are overpowering it, we are binding it, or we are subduing it so that people can be delivered. So Jesus demonstrated that for us by the Spirit of God. And then you and I today continue that same work in bringing deliverance to people by the Holy Spirit. And we see, you know, several more scriptures here. Uh, Matthew 16, 18 to 19, we are familiar with that. Where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he says, when he, he says, you know, I will build my church, he's, he's talking about you and me. He's going to build his church. At the very next line, he's talking about spiritual conflict and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I'm sure you've you've studied this, but I just want to just remind ourselves about it. Jesus said, you know, Matthew 16, 18 to 19, he says, I will build my church, referring to establishing the church on this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then he talks about the gates of hell. Right? So he's using a picture from the Old Testament or from the Bible times about the city gates where the elders of the city sat, they administered justice and so on. They controlled who came and who went out of the city gates. So the gates represent control. And here Jesus is talking about the gates of hell, meaning gates controlled by hell, areas of demonic domination. And remember, we go to the gates. The gates don't attack us. The gates are stationary but we advance to the gates so when jesus says, i will build my church and the gates of hell meaning the areas of demonic domination the church must advance to these areas of demonic domination and they will not be able to stop the church so that's the message right so the church has been authorized by heaven he said i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven the church has been given kingdom authority to advance to the gates of hell and the gates of hell those areas of demonic domination will not stop the church right so that is vested we can see it from the old testament from isaiah 42 we can see it in the new testament for the ministry of jesus and through what jesus said about the church that the church has been commissioned to bring deliverance to bring people spiritually to bring prisoners out of the prison to bring people out of darkness so we have to engage uh, in doing that it would be involved in that kind of work so when you're thinking about pioneering a church when you think about a local church this is an important aspect of what 
we are entering into. We are entering into the spiritual conflict. We are entering, stepping into our responsibility of saying, we're going to open blind eyes. We're going to bring prisoners out of the prison house. We're going to say to the prisoners, come forth to those who are sitting in darkness, show yourselves. That's what we are getting ready to do. This is a spiritual side. And the spiritual side is something we must engage in. And like I said, you know, initially uh, the church planting team probably are the only ones who are aware of it. Or sometimes they, they themselves may not be aware of it that, hey, in order to start a church, in order to start a Christian ministry, there's actually a spiritual side that you, you and I have to engage. And so we need to train our people. And that's one thing that, you know, even here at APC, uh, I, I really wanted to, do. to some extent, maybe people understand, but to a large extent, maybe not. Because the fact is most believers are thinking about, okay, you know, uh, there are needs in their lives. They think, okay, how do I address this need? How do I take care of my wife, my children, my family? Um, you know, all just the practical things of life. Now, to get them to think in terms of, okay, we got to share the gospel, we got to engage in spiritual warfare, is like, you know, three or four uh, steps away from their immediate life, the things that they're dealing with. So we must equip them to overcome their own personal struggles and personal challenges. But the goal is also to equip the church to be able to come into this place where we begin to engage spiritually. And if the church can engage spiritually, you know, the way we're supposed to engage, then we can do the spiritual work of opening blind eyes opening prison doors, of bringing people out of darkness, and doing those kinds of things. But then we have to prepare the people. You know, you can't take a civilian and say, hey, run into battle. He won't know, exactly, he won't know what to do, and it's also dangerous. He, he won't know which way is the enemy firing, and, you know, highly likely he'll get shot. So what do you do with the civilians? Well, you've got to train them. You got to equip them. You got to show them how to use the weapons of war, and then we move together as an army into battle. So, part of pioneering the church, and as we are developing the church, as we spoke about earlier, taking the church through its stages of growth and development along the journey, is to equip them for this kind of spiritual battle, and then getting them to engage. Because uh, that's the you know the spiritual dimension, the spiritual side of uh, planting a church in a city. Are you with me so far? Okay, Shikama, what's yes, sir, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Sir, I just want to know. Um, so, is it possible that, um, as you said, the if the church is not prepared with the 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 spiritual side, can it also influence the the believers who are attending the church, uh, irrespective of the church growth? Maybe the church uh, it seems to be like church is growing, uh, but um, but if the church is the individuals are under oppressions or or depressions or they are in bondage and, uh, and the church is not aware about that or church is not uh, uh, focusing also apparently uh, um, on this side. So, um, so, just my question is that: Is it possible that um, you know the the spirits can, even though they are coming to church, um, as a mass, you know, it's a very huge crowd, but they are still in the oppression and discouragement? Is it possible? I just want to know that if the church is not prepared for, for this thing. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. So, um, 
yeah, so the, the, this doesn't obviously have, uh, you know, doesn't the size of the church and the number of people in the congregation, uh, you know, it's, it's 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 not important at this time. Like, what's if people are not equipped, um, they will they won't know how to resist the devil. They won't know how to fight spiritual battles, not only for themselves but to win people in the city. So. Uh, basically, we need to equip people sp in for spiritual warfare, for their own good, to overcome the enemy in their own lives, to walk in victory in their own lives, and then extend that to fighting for the lost, battling for people who are held in the prisons, right? enforcing Christ's victory there. So to answer your question, yeah, if believers are not equipped for spiritual warfare, then definitely the enemy gains an advantage of them. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 2.11. He says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So when people are ignorant of his devices, they get in, Satan has an undue advantage over them. And then definitely they will not be able to engage in spiritual battle for the unsaved yeah thank you sir. so our next topic now is to okay understand how do we engage in spiritual battle which we will pick up tomorrow uh, but any questions till what we have covered today any other questions okay all right, so um, let's wrap up for today, and uh, we will pick this up tomorrow. We'll talk about, you know, the how do we engage in spiritual battle? How, well, how do we uh, equip the people to engage? Okay, could somebody please uh, pray with us, and we can dismiss. Anyone can pray. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful time and for this wonderful revelation and teachings of Father God. We pray that, Father, let it deeply rooted in us and Father God, and let it lead us, guide us, and let it increase our faith. Let it enlighten our understanding of Father. Thank you, Father, for using your servant to Father God. Thank you, Father God, for Lord, preparing our heart. Thank you, Father God, you are covering everything under your precious blood of Father God. Thank you once again, Father God, for this opportunity to learn from you, and which is strengthening us, O oh, Father God, to know you more, and Father God, to move ahead, to plan the churches, to establish, Lord Master, your plans in our life, oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. Amen. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, first. Thank you. God bless. Thank Bye you. now.